More than 170,000 students, representing 2,000 plus colleges and universities from more than 80 countries and regions. And they have been whittled down to around 160 or so teams. Today, we get to find out who the winners are, because this cue dramatic drum roll is the global final of Huawei's eighth annual ICT competition. Here in Shenzhen in China, just down the road from Huawei's HQ actually, it's the culmination of months of real life problem solving and computer based exams, of ideas being exchanged, networks developed, new skills learned, and now, doubtless, plenty of fingernails being anxiously chewed. And whoever wins gets to take away this impressive looking trophy, or, or maybe this one. There's actually quite a few up for grabs. Well, someone very used to winning prizes and plaudits is the German AI professor, Otthein Herzog. And I'm delighted that Professor Herzog joins us here today. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Can I just start by asking you how important ICT competitions such as this one from Huawei are in developing a, a talent ecosystem? First of all, I would like to say it's a ple my pleasure to talk to you today. And I think that's a very, very important question concerning the education of people in ICT. Because in many cases, ICT education at universities is buried in theory. And they are not very much in touch with reality. So having projects like that is very important for them, especially when they are working in teams. So it's a much more practical approach, a really hands-on approach. Yeah, it's a hands-on approach, it's a practical approach, and I'm sure they have to do also some, some theory to, in order to reach their goals. So everything comes together in such a really demanding project. It's interesting that AI, actually your specialist area, is featuring more prominently this year in both the innovation and the practice competition streams. Do you think that the public understanding of AI is improving or is, are we still in a sort of state of ignorance? Unfortunately, I think there is still a big ignorance, even if AI is almost 70 years old. But it was hidden in the past. People didn't notice that there was AI even. And today everybody is talking very, very powerful AI functions and people usually don't understand what their limitations are. So what can, what can a company such as Huawei do about that? Aside from contests such as this one, how can we increase public understanding? The best way would, of course, be to have very useful applications. So everybody would convince that AI helps to solve problems. Well, you've been recognized as one of the top 10 artificial intelligence minds in Germany. What in that field is, is exciting you most at the moment? That's a very good question. AI is fascinating overall anyway. Right? I'm doing AI since more than 40 years. But what's currently developing is what we earlier called sub-symbolic AI. That means neural networks, large language models, which are now really the last thing to do. And it's very, very fascinating because this new te technology opens a way to get access to huge amounts of knowledge. And knowledge is what you need to solve problems. So we have a new way today to do applications which really solve problems. You talked about large language models, LLMs. In your speech here today, and I just want to sort of quote you, you said, I foresee some years of fascinating development of LLMs, which certainly will capture the imagination of many scientists. So what specifically do you foresee there? I think what I already mentioned, the bottleneck of AI was always to formalize the knowledge needed to solve problems, because you need knowledge to solve problems, right? Without knowledge, it doesn't work. And it was very, very difficult to do that explicitly through rules or things like that. And today, we can give such a system as training data, multimodal data, which means images, text, maps, whatsoever. And the system then extracts the knowledge from this input, which is completely different. So the problem today is to select the right examples but that's easier than to explicitly define the knowledge. 
So it really opens up a new dimension of AI applications. And what will that enable us to do, this access to greater mm. knowledge and the ability to sift it more effectively? Of course, you have it today with uh, LLMs which are available today. If you use them, they have uh, almost a complete knowledge of the internet in their background. So that's really something which you could access before just through queries mm. and you got a page or 100 pages of hits and that and you had to select what was right. And that is being done today by that system. And it can talk to you also in your natural language, which is another very, very big ad advantage. Just, I referred to your speech earlier on. In that, when you talked about LLMs, you went on to say that with this uh, capturing the imagination and this fascinating development of LLMs, you said, mm -hmm. and thus that would improve the tools that are already very powerful today. Mm -hmm. So what tools and in what way will they be improved, do you think? They will be improved, for instance, to not to have one single big system. You will have societies of LLMs, specialists, LLM specialists, which work together and which help you to solve problems. Right? That's one way to go. And I think that's also very important for China, not to follow, for instance, the way the US is going, building larger and larger systems, but look at distributed LLMs, which can be much more powerful than one large one. How do you reassure the public when they hear you talk of LLMs and tools that are even more powerful? Mm -hmm. They might be quite alarmed, not encouraged by even more powerful and improved mm -hmm. tools. How do you reassure them that this is a positive development? I think you have to show them that there are valuable applications, but you have to show them also that there will be rules which set limits to those systems, because they could be misused, of course, mm. and we don't want to do that. So we have rules set in the European Union, in China, and maybe even that there will be some rules in the US. And I think that's also very, very important to see where the functionality of those systems should be limited. And just finally, I always have to finish with this question, are you optimistic, are you very positive about the technological ICT and AI future? Of course I am. <laughs> That's very natural if you are in that field and you see how it could proceed. It's fascinating since I'm working in that field and there was always progress. And I'm sure there will be progress and there will be progress on the hardware side, enabling us to do more on the software side and vice versa. So it's really a process which will go on, I hope, for still some time.